If you'll remain standing, we'll turn to your red hymnal to page 371, and we'll sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Hymn number 371. Amen. Take a moment and greet your neighbor in the name of the Lord this morning. As you make your way back to your seats, if you'll turn over on the back of your bulletins, we do have a few announcements this morning. Uh, this uh, coming Friday, uh, January 19th, uh, we need to have a finance committee meeting. So everybody that's on the finance committee, uh, we're going to meet here at the church at 530 and we're going to be talking about uh, the budget uh, for the coming year and make sure that we get that all lined out so that we can take it before the Ad Council uh, and get that approved. And so we need everybody on the finance committee to be here. And then we're trying to figure out a good time to have that ad council meeting. We know that uh, we're trying not to compete with the NFL on Sunday. Uh, but then we have basketball games and everything during the week. And so uh, we're, we'll let you know when that ad council meeting is going to be. And hopefully we can hit a good crowd there and, uh, and get that going. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, activities going on with the school, you know, as far as uh, basketball goes this week. Uh, there will be home games Tuesday night, and then the junior high have a tournament here uh, Thursday and Saturday. And so there's lots of stuff going on there. Is there anything else we need to announce this morning that I'm forgetting? Because I do tend to forget things sometimes. <laughs> anything? Okay, remind me, when is the Emmaus deal? The community meeting is next Sunday, but it's about right. the May of February meeting. Yeah, so next Sunday, I knew it was coming up, so it's next Sunday at the Baptist Church, they're having a community-wide worship service, and then in February, we're going to host it. 
uh, here, uh, the community-wide worship service, and so we'll be getting you some more information about that for, our, for February. Uh, is there anything else we need to announce this morning? All right, what about joys? What joys can we lift up before the congregation today? Well, good deal. No, no, I was going to ask you. I was going to put you on the spot. Wow, that's great. Well, anything over 60s, you know, that's good. That is really, really good. Um, Becky had some, a, a, some surgical procedure on Thursday, and that all went very well. And uh, she's at home recovering right now. So thank you all for uh, your prayers and for your support and for the ones of you that brought some, have brought some meals and those that will be bringing some meals. We appreciate that very, very much. Um, but she's, she's recovering and doing well, and so thank you for, that's a joy that all, that all went as it was supposed to go. So any other joys to lift up this morning? Who's that? <laughs> Susie's shaking her head. Is that a joy or a concern? You know, we start. You know, let's let, let, let's be optimistic. It's a it's a it's a joy. All right, good deal. <clears throat> well, let's look at our list of prayer concerns this morning. Are there any updates or additions to that today? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any others this morning? I think all our college kids are headed back. Yeah, it's, we, some of them have already gotten there and some of them are heading back. I know Colton's going back today. So pray for our college kids as they get going back into the spring semester. Any others this morning? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful that we can come into your house, fellowship with one another, sing praises to you, and hear your word, Lord. And so we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the word that you have for us today. May it be a word that would challenge us, renew us, and teach us, and give us a boldness to leave this place and be your disciples to the world around us. Lord, we're thankful for the joys that have been lifted up this morning and for those that we, we bring before you in our hearts. All those little things that we take for granted that are so, uh, such an awesome blessing from you, God. Homes to live in, food to eat, clean water to drink, a way to have income to meet the needs of our families. Just the ability to live in a place where we can come and worship you in freedom, Lord. So we give you thanks for these blessings. Lord, we lift up these this morning who still need to feel your healing touch or just, the, just a sense of your presence this day, God. We especially lift up the family of Joe and Connie Hernandez as they grieve the loss of Joe's father. We pray, Lord, that they would feel your arms around them, Lord, and that you would just surround them with the love of friends and family as they celebrate his life but still grieve his loss. Lord, we pray for each and every person on this list. If we see names on this list this week that we know, Lord, help us to um, find some time to in some way reach out to them and share the love of Jesus Christ with them. 
We lift up our college students as they uh, head back to school. Give them safe travels, Lord. Just uh, give them the desire to do the very best that they can do and to be the very best that they can be. Give them wisdom and guidance as they seek your plan for their lives and help them to be willing to and, and to desire to do what you want them to do with their lives and not what sometimes the culture tells them they need to be doing with their lives. Lord, we pray for this community. We pray, Lord, that you would just be with those this morning who are waking up without the hope and the joy that so many of us have in the Lord. That's one joy that many times we take for granted because we've known it for so long. But there are those this morning who are waking up hurting, depressed, without hope, desperately seeking purpose and answers and meaning to this life. God, we can share with them the hope. We can share with them the meaning of this life. And so God, just guide us. Open our eyes. Give us words to say. Create moments when we can have conversations with people that can help them see what it truly means to have a relationship with you. Lord, we pray for this country. We pray for our leaders. We pray that they would seek your guidance and wisdom as they make decisions that affect us all. We pray that your church would rise up in revival, that it would awaken and become once again the foundation of truth and hope and purpose and love that it was truly meant to be. And Lord, we pray for our world. For those this morning who are waking up without homes. For those this morning who are waking up being persecuted for their faith. For those who are waking up without clean water or enough food to eat. Lord, we pray that you would make a way for them to get the basic needs of life. That you would send missionaries into these places to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and with those that we would even call enemies, Lord. Because we know that without your love, and without the gospel, there can be no peace. And Lord, when we come to those times when we don't know what to say or even how to pray, help us remember we can always pray with confidence the prayer you taught your disciples when you prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is found... On page 399, take my life and let it be. We'll sing all three verses. Please rise.
Amen. You may be seated, and as you be seated, let the little children come, and we'll have our children's message this morning. children. <laughs> we're doing better now than we were a little bit earlier, weren't we? Yeah, trying to get ready for church. <laughs> uh, okay. You're going to help me this morning. I come to find out, I was the Sunday school teacher this morning and we talked about Esther. And they already knew about Esther because they went to Roots. So I was very impressed. Thank you, Michelle Bella, very much for teaching them this story. Okay, so who wants to start? You want to start? You want your paper? <laughs> you want to get your paper out? All right, tell me who was Esther? What was she? What religion was she? She was a Jew. Who was her uh, command and adopted her? Um, her cousin. It starts with an M. So who's the king? Huh? Okay. The king was, and I think you all called him Xerxes. Xerxes, didn't you? Okay. And um, so Mordecai said, you know, go before the king, but don't tell him. Tell me the rest. Don't tell him what? That you're, that you're a Jew. That you're a Jew. Why? They will kill. He will kill. All right. He will kill all the Jews. So the Jews kind of had to lay low, didn't they, and do exactly what was said. All right. So he, she became the wife, one of the wives of um, Xerxes. Uh huh. And um, who was the other the bad man? The other guy that worked with Mordecai. What was Haman? Haman. Haman. What was Haman going to do? He was going to kill all the Jews. So, but did the king know this? No. And he was trying to keep it that way. So the king, if he found out, he would kill. Come on. Okay. All right. So. On a pole. What did the queen do? She And? Uh, told him to go to a banquet or something. That's when. I have a favor I want to ask you. And then at the party, Haman Will is trying to kill the Jews. Mordecai. So did that happen? No. What happened? He got. He. The king. Uh, May. Yeah, come on, got killed on a pole, a sharp pole. It was that he had made, that he had asked his servants to make for a morning. This is the part they really liked the best was the pole and the killing, you know, and all that. <laughs> they got that. They got that off good. All right. So we got rid of Haman, and then what did we do after Haman? Mordecai became. Oh, he got um, he got Haman's place. He got Haman's place. He got half of the territory, didn't he? Half, half of, of the, the king. Half of the king stuff. So Mordecai told them, sent out a decree not to do what Haman wanted, not to kill the Jews, but to kill all the people. That, no, didn't, kill that didn't Haman's believe son. in God, the okay. fake gods. Right. Okay. Okay. Kill Haman's son. Right. Kill Haman's son. The ten sons. The ten sons, and they put them all on what? Poles. Put them all on poles. Right. Right. So right. the village could see what bad it. people they were. All right. And so the Jews 
retaliated, and they killed a whole bunch of people too, didn't they? Yeah, okay. Five hundred. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and All they right. told the king that what they did, and the king was glad. The king was glad, All right. and he was. Um, now we, and then we talked at the very end. Was it really the king and Esther? Yeah. He gave. He, he gave. gave the king a drink. Okay. What did he do before that? Um, to Esther. She told her people to do what? Um, to. Well, she went to see the king. She said, please pray. Pray for, for me. Please pray for me. And then the king had a division. Who's the division from? God. Okay. So all of this had to do with what God, God did for those Jewish people. Okay, very good, very good, okay. All right, let's say a prayer. Thank you, dear Lord, for this church. We thank you for our religion. We thank you for Christ that died on the cross. Please watch over all of this, us this week and those that are away, help them for safe travels. In Jesus' name, amen. As the kids are going back to their seats, if we could have some ushers gather in the back, we'll take our morning offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray now that you would help us to give with cheerful hearts and to take these funds that we give to you, multiply them and be, so that they can be used for your glory here in Throckmorton and all around the world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. rise for the doxology. may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. 
Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. And then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And so Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling, as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. And therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I'm very conscious as I stand here of how many people fail to hear the call of God Despite all the talk that the church does about how we are called to be followers of Jesus and despite all the sermons that state that we are called to be like prophets and to hear and speak God's word to one another. Why is that? Why do so many people, many of them fine people, many of them people who already believe in God and accept Jesus as their Savior, believe that God is not speaking to them personally? That God is not trying to guide them in a particular way. That God is not reaching out to them. I think that the answer to why people fail to hear the call of God, while they fail to notice how God is summoning them, it, it's not because the call is not being issued, but it's because they either don't know how God calls us, or it's because they allow themselves to pass over that call to set it aside, as it were, and so grow used to ignoring the word when it comes. Think about Samuel for a minute. He was a pretty special kid. If you read his story in the Bible, you'll see that, that he was a special gift from God to his mother Hannah. He was dedicated to the Lord by her upon his birth, and when he was still very young, he was sent to live with the priest Eli, at Shiloh to be his apprentice. And the scripture says that he lived in a time in which the word of the Lord was very rare, a time in which visions were not widespread. Nevertheless, Samuel lived in a holy place and in the holy presence. He witnessed the sacrifices made at the altar in Shiloh. And even as a child, he wore the priestly garments and ministered in the house of God. Like his teacher Eli, he prayed to God. Like his master, he served faithfully. Like others, he had heard the teachings proclaimed and all the stories about God's power and God's love. Samuel lived in a special place. Indeed, the scripture says that Samuel grew up in the presence of God. So you would think that Samuel then, of all people, should have been able to recognize the call of God. 
But as the story tells us in the third chapter of the book of Samuel, he did not. That is, he did not until Eli recognized the call for him. We are told that three times the Lord called to Samuel where he lay in bed and three times he answered by saying, Here I am and running out to see Eli in the next room. And on the third occasion, Eli kind of starts to understand what's going on. And so he tells him, the next time he calls, say, Lord, your servant is listening. And so it was that Samuel finally heard what it was that God wanted to say to him. How much are we like Samuel? I mean, if you think about it, we live in a pretty special place. I mean, think about it, of all the, of all the, the nations of the world, how, how many others have the freedoms that we have? The freedom to come to church anywhere we want to come to church, on whatever day we want to come. The freedom to, to even own a Bible. The freedom to, to, to be a part of God's, in, in God's Word anytime we want to. We, we live in a pretty special place. Take some time, if you haven't already, and study some other countries in the world where it's not so easy to live as a Christian. Most of us this morning, uh, we grew up listening to the stories of God's love in things like Roots, Sunday School, Vacation Bible School, church camps. We've grown up on the stories of God's love, just like Samuel did. Many of us have grown up also finding ways in which we can serve Him in His house. Just like our acolytes come up and light the candles or they, they act out the nativity play. Or from the time of their childhood all the way up through their adulthood, they, they're, they're in the house of God and they're serving Him. When we were baptized, when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we were dedicated to the Lord. We became God's. We became His children. His sons and his daughters. So just like Samuel, we have been dedicated to God. And yet many of us, many times I, when I've talked to the youth, sometimes when I've even talked to adults, they say they've really never heard God speak to them before. They've never heard God tell them to do something or to, to be somewhere or to say something. Uh, they just don't even really have a recollection of God speaking to them. And if they have, it's a rare thing. Maybe just once or twice in their lifetime they can say that they maybe heard God speak. But what if? What if God speaks to us much more than we give Him credit for? What if God actually speaks to us practically every day, but we don't hear Him? Because we have preconceived notions of what it means to hear God speak. And when it doesn't happen the way we think it should, we don't think it's happening at all. I mean, we really only have the Bible to refer to when it comes to seeing how God spoke to his people. And so sometimes we assume that that's how he always does it. We're listening for that audible voice of God. I wonder what that sounds like. I wonder if God speaks in the voice of maybe, I mean, think about maybe James Earl Jones. You know, you hear that voice. Corky, I want you to go to Wichita Falls today. There you'll find a homeless man on the corner of Kell and whatever, and you, you are to give him food. And sh That would be awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> to hear the audible voice of God, I mean, that's, that's what we see you know, a lot of times in Scripture. Or maybe we have this, this vivid dream in which an angel comes and tells us something. Like we see in the Bible sometimes. But I think God speaks to us in a whole, in many, many other ways than just those ways. And you have to remember something too. Uh, it, it's a lot different for us now than it was for Samuel and for Eli then. We're so much more blessed than they are, than they were. Why? Well, for one thing, Jesus has come. Jesus has come and become one of us, showed us in his physical life 
how to live the life that God has called us to live and then sacrificed himself to atone for our sins. We don't have to keep taking lambs and, and, and doves and things to the altar you know, every year to atone for our sins. We have a, a Savior who's come and done that for us. And then it gets even better. When he ascended to his Father's right hand, he sent the Holy Spirit to live within each and every one of us as followers of Jesus Christ, we have God inside of us through that Holy Spirit. They didn't have that then. We have that now. We also have God's Word. You know, in its entirety, they only had bits and pieces of it in Eli and Samuel's time. So we live in a whole different a whole different era when it comes to God and how God can speak and work in our lives than, than Samuel and Eli did. So what if? What if the voices that we hear in the night are, are, are not coming from the other room? What if our dreams are not simply the result of eating too much before we go to bed? What if that inner nudge that we feel is not just coming from our own intuition or from the fact that our unconscious mind is try, trying to play a trick on us. What if? You know, God speaks to us and calls us in many ways and in many forms. And almost all of them are gentle, subtle, and almost all of them can be mistaken for something else. That is, until we heed those calls. And then we discover the power of God that is in them and behind them. Now, as I've said before, I've never heard the audible voice of God. But I have no doubt that God has spoken to me. He's spoken to me through my own voice in my head, telling me things that I never would have told myself. He's spoken to me through dreams, dreams so vivid that you think you're awake. Through visions in which you see the end result or the potential end result of something. He's spoken to me through other people. People of God who have come to me and given me a word of wisdom or direction that they received from God in prayer. He's spoken to me through other people who God has blessed with wisdom just to see the most common sense approach to a problem or an issue. But do you know when he speaks to me the most? Do you know how he talks to me and shares things with me the most? It's when I pick up this book. The Living Word of God. And I read it. And I meditate on it. And I digest it. This right here is the most prevalent way that God speaks to his people today. Having trouble in your marriage? Get in the Word. Having trouble financially? Get in the Word. Having trouble with depression and anxiety? Get in the Word. Having trouble with friends and relatives? Get in the Word. Having trouble deciding where to go next or, or what to even do with your life? Get in the Word. Because the answers are all in here. We don't call it God's word for nothing, right? In the Bible, if you do get into it, if you do begin to read it and not just read it, but meditate on it and really let it sink in, it begins to act as a kind of gateway of sorts that creates in us a more sensitive spirit to receive the word of God in other ways as well. The more we study and meditate on his word, the more likely we're going to hear his voice in our heads, in our dreams through other people who come to speak to us in His name. The Word of God breaks down walls and barriers that have shielded us from hearing and accepting, and it leaves us in a more sensitive place to hear and receive. Gosh, I can't tell you how many times just reading God's Word has helped me cope with or get through a trying time in my life. How meditating on his word has opened my eyes to seeing new things and new ways of looking at situations that I never would have considered before. It's amazing. But here's the deal. It's not going to happen unless you do it. So many folks have Bibles, two, three, four Bibles in their house, sitting on a bookshelf somewhere, collecting dust. 
They don't do any good unless you open them. One of the things that hinders people sometimes is that they say, well, it's just too hard to understand. I try, I read, and, and, and it's, like, it's, it, it's like reading another language. I just don't really understand the translation or, or, or what God's trying to say to me. Okay? A hundred years ago, you might could have used that as an excuse. Folks, today, there's so many translations of the Bible out there, we really can't do that anymore. If you're having trouble understanding your Bible, find one you can understand. Because there's translations of God's Word out there that make it really easy for you to understand and get it. Don't think that you just have to read Great Grandma's King James Version of the Bible, and that's the only one there is. There's a lot of people who can understand the King James Version of the Bible, and God bless you. That is awesome. I have a hard time with it. But there are versions out there that you can understand. I just want to give you an example. This is a scripture, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 through 21. I want you to hear the difference between these two versions. They say exactly the same thing, but which one's easier for you to understand? This is the King James version of it. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Now hear the same verse, 1 John 4, 20-21, from the Message Translation. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he's a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to do both. Trust me, folks. There's versions out there you can understand. Guess what? I've got a whole bunch of these cards right here. If you, don't have, if you have a smartphone and you don't have a Bible app on your phone... I'll give you one of these right here after church. You can download this baby on your smartphone, and guess what? It even has audio versions of several of the translations, so you can plug in your little headphones, or you can you know, plug it into the auxiliary jack on your car while you're driving to Wichita Falls or to Abilene, and you can listen to the Bible. It's that simple. It's that simple. There is no excuse for not having the Bible in a Bible that you can understand anymore. There's just not. There's just not. So if you're having trouble understanding yours, get a new one. You're not going to offend anybody. It's okay. Get a new one. And a lot of people say, well, what about prayer? Doesn't God speak to us through prayer? Sure he does. But the thing is, a lot of times we have this misconceived notion of what prayer is. I mean, if if prayer to you is giving God your lists and a few memorized lines that we like from somebody else's prayer, then is that really prayer? Not that God doesn't want to hear your list. Okay, he does. It's okay, he's okay with your lists. But you've got to understand something. Prayer is a discipline because prayer is a conversation. It's a conversation. And a lot of us, me included at times, we make it a one-way conversation. You cannot hear the voice of God through prayer if you're not willing to build in time to listen for it. And listening for God to speak to you through prayer is hard because we have a very hard time with silence. That was about 30 seconds. Could you have stood another 30? 
It's hard. It's hard. To be silent outwardly is one thing. To be, be silent inwardly is quite another. In that 30-second silence, you guys are pretty good about staying quiet on the outside. But what about inside? He needs to wrap this up or the assembly of God's going to beat us to the cafe again. <laughs> Football game starts at what time? Oh man, I got, I got, to, I got to remember to do that before tomorrow. You know? Did your mind start wondering? Our minds are busy and they drown out the voice of God. Yes, God can speak to us in our prayer time, but man, that's a discipline. And it takes time and it requires a lot of work to perfect that time when you can carve out a moment in your prayer time, like I said, 30 seconds to a minute or even a little bit longer, when you can silence that voice in your head and listen. And listen. I encourage you to work on that. I want you to strive because that's something we all need to work on, to spend time in prayer where we don't only talk to God, but we actually listen to God without thinking of a million other things while we're trying to listen. But that's a discipline. But in the meantime, while you're working on that, in the meantime, read his word every day and know that God is speaking to you. And don't ever say that God has never spoken to me. Don't say that God never talks to me or speaks to me because when you read his word, he's speaking to you. Keep working on your prayer life and developing that. But the main thing to remember is this, that God loves you and God wants to speak to you every single day. And the most reliable in the way he speaks to us the most today is through his word right here. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that it's just so accessible. It's just so easy to get. It's such a blessing. But Lord, we confess to you this morning so many times it sits on a shelf. Or maybe in the back seat of the car. Or maybe we have the Bible app on our phone, but we don't ever access it and we wonder why sometimes you don't talk to us and why we can't hear your voice when it's just right there in front of us Lord give us a desire put within us a hunger to hear you speak to us to hear your word to find the answers to the questions we have, to find the direction that we want for our lives, to look in the place where we can find it. It's right there. So if we do nothing else this year, Lord, may we develop a hunger for your word so that you can speak to us and guide us in each and every way that you want us to go. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is from the uh, Red Hymnal. It'll be page number 593, and we will sing, Here I am, Lord, if you'll rise and join me in singing. Hymn number 593. Shall I say? 
And may the Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of his Holy Spirit, and to the honor and glory of God the Father, give you a hunger for his word, so that you might hear his voice every day. And then may you have the desire to follow that word and be the people he's created you to be. Amen.